Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's great to see so many of you here. I'm Jamie Wagman, Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and History, and I'll be moderating this panel with Liz Colston, Coordinator of the Bells Against Violence Office. This panel, Let's Talk About Sex, is co-sponsored by the President's Committee in Sexual Violence and the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. The panel is an introduction into the ways in which sexuality is part of many scholarly disciplines and facets of our lives. I'll now introduce our speakers before their talks, and then there will be time for a Q&A session afterward. Dr. Jessica Koblenz is a faculty member in the Department of Religious Studies and Theology where her research and teaching focuses on contemporary Catholic theology, feminism, and mental health. Her talk is titled, Is It Just Sex? Theolog Theologizing Sex as a Justice Issue. Dr. Laura Elder of Global Studies is a cultural anthropologist who studies gender, Islam, and political economy in South and Southeast Asia. Her talk is titled Gender and Sexuality and Global Perspective. Dr. Kelly Faust has her PhD in sociology from Western Michigan. Her areas of specialization are criminology and feminism. Since joining St. Mary's in 2017, she has taught sociological imaginations and redesigned several criminology courses. Her previous research has focused on issues related to teaching, gender, power, state crime, natural disasters, and victimization with a social justice lens. Dr. Faust just started working with the South Bend LGBTQIA Center to prepare a community survey and needs assessment. And the title of her talk is Out and About in South Bend. Dr. Cassie Majedic is a professor in the Department of Biology and Environmental Studies at St. Mary's, teaching courses in introductory biology, evolution, environmental biology, conservation biology, plant animal interactions, and introductory environmental science. Her research focuses on floral scent, plant chemistry, and plant pollinator interactions. Her talk title is Plant Mating Systems. It's complicated. We would also like to let our audience know that all questions submitted through the chat tonight will only be seen by panelists. So please feel free to ask anything. I'll end with a quote from sexuality studies scholar, Jeffrey Weeks, who says, the more expert we become in talking about sexuality, the greater the difficulties we seem to encounter in trying to understand it, because sex is a focus for powerful feelings. And this is just one more reason that we must keep talking and trying to understand it. So let's talk about sex. Thank you so much. And Liz Colston will now say a few words before the professors begin. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Colston, and I am the coordinator of the Bells Against Violence office here at St. Mary's. I wanted to give a quick reminder to all of our students um, to complete the sexual assault climate survey that you may have already seen in your emails. Um, it's come through a few times. By filling that out, you help us um, better address these problems of interpersonal violence on our campus by putting on programming just like this one. Even if you yourself haven't been personally affected by interpersonal violence, it's still um, really important that you fill out that survey and share that information anonymously with the school. So please, please, please fill that out uh, in the next couple of weeks. And then just a final reminder before we get started to always continue to take care of yourselves. And that includes events like this one tonight. Um, if you feel that it might be better for you to temporarily mute uh, or walk away from your computer, please feel free to do so. The most important thing is that you take care of your own mental health and your own well being. Thanks, everyone. Hi everyone, uh, Professor Koblenz here. I'm so delighted uh, to be talking about sex with all of you tonight. As my bio indicated, I'm joining this conversation as a scholar of Catholic theology, which means that I'm trained to analyze and debate topics using the diverse and expansive beliefs and practices of the Catholic faith. Now, based on my experience of exploring Catholic theology with St. Mary's students, 
I suspect that if I asked you what the Catholic Church has to say to us about sex, most of your answers could be summed up with one simple word. No, <laughs> that is no masturbation, no premarital sex, no artificial birth control, no LGBTQ relationships, and so on. A whole lot of no's. That's what many of us associate with Catholic perspectives on sex. And this is not a wholly inaccurate characterization. Uh, the Catholic Church asserts many of what we would call negative prohibitions when it comes to sex. I often hear at St. Mary's uh, that these prohibitions are not especially helpful to adults like us who are striving to understand our own complex bodies and sexualities while navigating the particularities of sexual relationships. I think it's important to acknowledge this and to engage these doubts about whether Catholicism can help us reflect on sex today. Students often tell me two things when I ask them why these Catholic prohibitions against sex seem so unhelpful or even irrelevant. And I wanna address these two points as a springboard for my additional remarks. So first, students tell me that the Catholic Church's rules about sex are unhelpful because all rules about sex are unhelpful. <laughs> In other words, the problem isn't that the Catholic Church prohibits this or that. The problem is that the Catholic Church still has rules about sex at all. On this, students tell me that sex is a private matter. And so people should be figuring out what constitutes good and bad sex on their own. We might think of this as the you do you line of reasoning, right? You do sex your way, I'll do sex my way. If everybody, including the Catholic Church, would just mind their own business, then we'd all be better off. This may seem like a, a fitting corrective to situations where the church and other institutions have overregulated or unjustly regulated people's sex lives. But I find that when we press this line of reasoning a bit further, most students don't actually agree with this. And they don't because there are many rules about sex that students do see as important, not only for themselves individually, but for us collectively. Take, for example, our contemporary prohibition against non-consensual sex. I have not met a St. Mary's student who objects to this rule. In fact, I am thrilled, thrilled that students adamantly defend it. And when doing so, no student that I've met argues that this rule need only be upheld on an individual basis. No one is telling me, I think non-consensual sex is bad, but you do you. No, no one is saying that. One thing that this example reveals is that many of us do think there is such a thing as good and bad sex. And we want some rules that help us adjudicate that. But we want rules that can uh, that we can authentically get behind and which actually help us navigate the complexities of our lives. So the question this leaves us with is, does the Catholic Church offer such guidelines, right? Ones that will help us. <laughs> this brings me to the second response I hear from students on why they struggle with all the Catholic prohibitions against sex. Many students tell me that they want guidance to help them navigate sex, but the church's prohibitions are just too old fashioned to be taken seriously. Now there's some, some truth to this characterization, right? Catholicism is old. <laughs> and in so far as Catholicism grounds its views about sex in ancient scriptures and in 2000 years worth of beliefs and practices, then it's correct to say that Catholic teachings are old, at least in terms of their source material. But just because authors and texts and ideas are old doesn't mean they are necessarily unhelpful and irrelevant, right? Many old authors from Plato and Aristotle to Mary Wollstonecraft and Sojourner Truth have true and even prophetic wisdom for our time. I think most students agree with that. So when I hear that Catholic views on sex are old fashioned, I don't think people actually believe that it's the age of Catholic teachings that make them irrelevant. 
What I suspect they mean is that the language and foundational presumptions of Catholic teachings are not as readily understood and translated and applied to our contemporary context as they might have been in times past. In other words, it's no longer obvious how or whether the Catholic Church's old ideas matter for our sex lives today. One of the tasks of, of theologians like me is to explain how these old teachings and practices can and should be applied to our lives so that it's clear why and how they are relevant. So I'm gonna give that a shot with the time that I have left, all right? I wanna introduce some Catholic guidelines for good sex. Since I think most of us do want good sex, and we do want some rules to help us discern and actualize it. When I'm done, you'll have to tell me whether the rules that I've introduced uh, can be helpful and relevant to us today. So first off, this notion that there is good and bad sex has deep roots in the Christian tradition, which has always held that there are right and wrong ways of relating to oneself and to others. Christians inherited this notion of right and wrong relationship from their Jewish predecessors and the Hebrew scriptures that Christians share with the Jewish people. The Hebrew scriptures reveal that God, the creator of the world, is a God of relationship, a God who establishes a relationship or covenant with God's people and who offers them guidelines, commandments, and rules to help them live good lives. God instructs that in order to be in right relationship with God, we have to be in right relationship with our neighbors and with ourselves. In the New Testament scriptures, these Jewish teachings are reiterated by Jesus, who was himself a Jew, when he identified God's greatest commandments as, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. We can see here that right relationship with God, with self, and with neighbor all go together. Since the earliest days of Judaism and Christianity, rules have served as guidelines for these right relationships. These rules shaped every aspect of people's lives, their worship, their diets, and yes, their sex lives. Some of these rules for right relationship were negative prohibitions. Think, do not murder. While others, other rules, are what we call positive obligations. That is, rules that lay out what we should do, what we owe to God, to ourselves, and to other people. So this notion that rules can help us discern and actualize right relationships, including sexual relationships, is a longstanding idea in Christianity. In this sense, it is totally fitting that Catholics today would ask themselves, what does a right relationship with self and with others and therefore with God look like in the context of sex? I noted that there have always been different kinds of rules that guide Christians as they strive for right relationships, both the negative prohibitions and uh, positive obligations. I don't think we hear enough about the church's positive obligations when it comes to sex. So that's what I wanna talk about a little bit more with you. Sister Margaret Farley, one of the world's leading Catholic theologians argues that a positive obligation to justice should guide our sexual relationships today. In other words, she argues that we have a positive moral obligation to relate to ourselves and to others in a just fashion when it comes to sex. So a good sexual relationship is a just sexual relationship. Farley explains that a just relationship is one that renders to each person what he or she or they are owed. The specific, the specifics, excuse me, of what a person is owed will vary a little bit according to their concrete realities. But from a Catholic perspective, there are some basic obligations that we owe to all human beings in sexual relationships, including ourselves. 
Farley identifies seven of these basic obligations actually, but I'm just gonna highlight a couple for your consideration. First, a just sexual relationship is characterized by a mutuality of participation. According to Farley, just sex entails some degree of mutuality in the attitudes and actions of all partners. It entails some form of activity and receptivity, giving and receiving. This means that just sex is never about one person's desires alone. A just sexual relationship centers on where sexual desires converge among partners, and that will differ across and even within relationships. What's more, Farley notes that the possibilities of mutuality exist for many forms of relationships, whether heterosexual or gay, whether with genital sex or the multiple other ways of embodying our desires and our loves. It is therefore the obligation of all persons involved in a sexual relationship to determine and maintain this mutuality according to their own circumstances. So Farley wants us to ask ourselves, what would a mutuality of participation look like in our own particular sexual relationships? And when we consider what's concretely required for a mutuality of participation in sexual relationships, it's not hard to imagine its practical implications for things like uh, communication or for equality between partners, I think. The second characteristic of just sexual relationships that I wanna highlight is fruitfulness. By fruitfulness, Farley means something like um, generativity. Sexual relationships should be life-giving. They should help us grow and connect with others beyond ourselves. Farley explains, quote, love of all kinds brings new life to those who love. The new life within the relationship of those who share it may move beyond itself in countless ways, nourishing other relationships, providing good services and beauty for others, informing the fruitful work lives of the partners in relation, uh, helping to raise other people's children and so on, end quote. When I think of this norm of fruitfulness, the famous line from the ancient theologian Irenaeus of Lyon comes to mind. He said, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. I take this to mean that God relishes in our joy and creativity and fulfillment. Therefore, a just relationship, be it uh, sexual or otherwise, is one that enables us to flourish, to be more generative members of the human family. In turn, a sexual relationship that undermines our well being or cuts us off from our communities or deadens us rather than making us more fruitful members of society, that kind of relationship is unjust. So we should ask ourselves, what kinds of sexual relationships cultivate this kind of fruitfulness? And based on this, we can anticipate why Farley connects this characteristic of just sexual relationships to gender justice and sexual justice, right? An exploitative or abusive sexual relationship will not be a fruitful one in this sense, okay? So let me wrap up by just briefly reiterating what I've offered here, all right? I've proposed that Catholic theology, old as its sources may be, may offer us helpful and relevant resources for adjudicating good and bad sex, a distinction that uh, has always been important for this faith community because right relationship to God, self, and others is central to the Catholic faith. To that end, I've identified a positive moral obligation to guide our sexual relationships, suggesting that we should aspire for just sexual relationships. That is for, for sex that unfolds among persons who are given what they are owed, namely a mutuality of participation and fruitfulness among other things. Thanks so much. So I think I'm next, um, which is why I'm turning it on. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Koblenz. Um, wow, that was fascinating. Um, and I cannot wait for the questions. This is um, just so much fun. 
Um, thanks uh, for everyone who's here. It's so exciting to see so many people interested in talking about sex. I am going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint. If you'll give me a quick chance here, very quickly. Okay. And I think that should be showing. Please um, type into the uh, the chat if you can't see that, everyone. Um, so I'm going to take us in a completely different direction, but as you'll see, it's um, very much connected to what has come before. So I'm going to take us away from our own context and think a little bit about gender and sexuality in other places, uh, in the places that we are so intimately connected to as we see in this pandemic, uh, as well as in all the other aspects of our lives. Oops, that didn't work. Okay, there we go. Uh, so thinking a little bit about this, um, I, I'm fascinated with this uh, piece of art by Mona Hatoum, um, which I think helps us a little bit to understand what we're talking about uh, when we talk about gender and sexuality, not as binaries, but rather as things that are in fact um, moving on a continuum and an, on, a, on a spectrum. Um, and I'm going to talk about gender and sexuality because I'm a social scientist and we see those as very much interconnected um, and influencing uh, each other. And that's why I'm gonna mix and match as we go here, just as in this cup of tea that you see. Um, so thinking a little bit about our context, um, you might notice your professors and, and some of the folks that you deal with on a daily basis are specifying their pronouns in relation to gender. So she, her, they, them. Um, this is increasingly popular and it stems from this shared understanding that we have in the United States and more broadly that actually gender and sexual orientation are um, not fixed and not two, not a binary, but rather diverse. Um, if, we, if we think about the world, um, we often approach the world from a very skewed percep perception. We often approach from the place where we are and the things that we know. And I'm just throwing this map in here to give you a sense that Actually, the world looks very different if you don't approach it from your own singular perspective. Um, if we do that, um, it may surprise you just to know that actually this understanding of difference in sexuality, which is not just homosexual and heterosexual or not just male, female, um, this understanding is actually um, something that the rest of the world has been talking about for a very long time. So for example, if we travel around the world and we compare, we can see some interesting things about sexual orientation and how it shows um, how important it is, uh, the, the power to define and control sexuality, how that actually works through culture. Um, and you can see that in relation to thinking about Catholic theology of you just see, as you've just seen, and you can see it in relation to the, the talks that are gonna come as well. Um, so what do we see if we look all around the world? We see radical variability of sexual orientation, identity practices through time and space all around the world, not just here, but everywhere. We see radical variation in the cultural meaning of sex and sexuality and gender. Um, because of this diversity, cultural anthropologists say that sexuality is not a biological given, it's actually culturally construed. It come, you come to learn about your sexuality through your culture. Um, therefore, there's nothing natural about systems of sexuality, and there's also nothing natural about stigmatism and repression of sexuality. Uh, and then just last but not least, classification of people according to sexuality and or gender together is not biologically determined. It's actually learned through culture. So let's just run around the world really quickly and think a little bit about some examples of how that has worked through time. So I'm gonna take us to Oman first, and I'm doing that on purpose because most Americans don't know where Oman is. Um, and it's also a place um, that has been relatively understudied, uh, particularly in our context. So in Oman, we can see the Zanith, which are male bodied persons who may have sex with men, but also perform a female gender role in dress and style, and may switch to a male role in a female partner as they go through life. Um, some cultures explicitly allow for more than two genders and permit the expression of varied forms of sexual orientation and sexuality without stigma. And that brings us back to our own context. Um, there's a long history amongst indigenous cultures in North America 
of a third gender known as twin spirited. You might notice if you're on the west coast of the United States or if you're in Canada, that is a gender that you can select when you're applying for a job and they're collecting information about you, um, increasingly common. Uh, so in this case, you see flexibility in terms of uh, individuals choosing their role. In the case of twin spirited, sometimes parents would choose that role for their children as well. Um, if we go forward and <clears throat> we go to Muslim Southeast Asia, confounding perhaps some of our expect expectations about sexuality in Islam, uh, we can see the same kind of fluidity and permeability uh, in relation to sexual orientation and gender roles. Um, if we go in here, I'm taking us to Sulawesi in Indonesia, a bisu, uh, for example, is a male bodied individual who assumes female attire and other aspects of femininity and acts as a religious special specialist uh, and engages in sexual and marital relations that are simultaneously homosexual and heterogender, uh, married and having sexual relations with a male bodied person who is also performing a male role unlike the bisu who usually is socially construed as female, but sometimes not. So again, the complexities that we see as we go around the world. Uh, the most famous example of course comes from Thailand. And um, this is usually the example that most people in the United States have encountered. Thailand has a, a long history of having a, a recognition of three genders. Uh, and it's rooted actually in the origin stories of how humans came to inhabit the earth. Uh, in this particular origin story, um, the Katui actually are both the mother and the father of all humans at the same time. So being your own mother and father at the same time through this idea of a third gender. Um, within this trinity of gender roles, sexual preference and sexuality is sorting, sorted according to heterosexual for male and female and bisexual, heterosexual or homosexual according to the third role. So you can see that, that complexity that comes through. Um, as, we're, as we're thinking about this, um, all across the world, we see these extraordinary movements against sexual and gender binaries and also against sexual discrimination. And here, this is just me walking through the um, subway in South Korea and I just couldn't help myself. Uh, thinking a little bit about gender roles and plastic surgery, and also thinking about South, South Korea's anti mocha or hidden camera, as well as their Me Too and Escape Corset movements. These were the largest mobilizations of women in the history of South Korea in the past few years, really extraordinary mobilization against sexual violence and also gender discrimination. Uh, we see the same thing happening in Hong Kong as well. And then I'm gonna stick in East Asia for a little while and um, talk a little bit about China. And in this case, <clears throat> we can see uh, global connections to the Me Too movement. You might have encountered Rice Bunny, which the kanji for Rice Bunny translate come across um, in terms of phonetics as Me Too. And this was used as a, a means of mobilizing online against um, gender and sexual discrimination in um, China. Although I have to tell you at this particular point, um, the censors of course have set, shut down Me Too. Um, and now Rice Bunny has moved on to a whole series of different language, but still mobilizing uh, in relation to the same issues. Uh, sticking with China for a second and thinking about these kinds of, of mobilizations and, and the, um, the ways that people are seeking to both talk about sexuality and also transform sexuality. I just wanted to share you, with you the example of the really fascinating work of Tian Tian Zeng, who's a professor at State University of New York. Um, and she spent quite a lot of time thinking about men attracted to men in post-socialist China. Uh, and she was particularly interested in thinking about terminology and ways that people are identifying and conceptualizing and mobilizing around different identities. And so just to give you a sense of how that is working uh, in the past and also in the present in China, you can see this term Tongsi, which translates as comrade and is specifically an attempt to get away from language of same sex love or homosexuality, the kinds of language that have, has, has been used negatively in China. Um, some people are also mobilizing around the word gay as a, a self-referential aspirational element as well, while connecting, imagining connections to the broader global community. Other people are really much more attached to language that goes ones and zeros, 
which uh, um, connects to a sexual role and then also to a gender role um, and includes this idea of, of a hierarchy of gender roles. Um, just want to point out um, that, of course, um, China's uh, under thinking about um, sexuality, thinking about gender, thinking about expression, thinking about mobilizing in China, things are changing really quickly um, and are continuing to change, particularly um, given surveillance and increased surveillance around the, the pandemic and what is happening right now. Before the Republican era, sexuality was really viewed um, much more closer to um, this, the cup of tea that we started with, the social science understanding, malleable, changeable, different kinds of behaviors accepted, much less stigmatized, um, as long as your obligations to your family were, um, were completed, were adhered to. You then have the colonial era, and here this is just an image of um, Western colonial powers taking a bite out of China. And currently in China, in relation to thinking about uh, minority sexualities, um, there's a very, very pervasive and powerful view, which is documented by the scholar I mentioned, Tin Tin Ding, uh, regarding homosexuality as um, abnormal and something that is to be stigmatized. And I'm not going to read this quote, but it's really quite startling. Uh, she conducted hundreds of interviews, and this has very much become a, a dominant um, narrative in the context of China in the present. Of course, against that, you see increasing mobilizations, uh, but you also see increasing marginalization because of the pandemic and the kinds of effects that we've seen in terms of surveillance. Um, so again, moving around the world, um, cross-cultural comparison shows us that sexual practices and sexual identities are formed in a social context and that both remain central to continually changing definitions of sexuality, what counts as good sex, what counts as bad sex, uh, what counts as um, something that should be legalized and recognized by the state. Um, we can see this in the extraordinary work of Shireen Alfeki, uh, who is from the University of Cambridge, and she has a, just a remarkable long-term study of thinking about um, changing ideas about sexuality in the Middle East and North Africa region, really quite extraordinary. And just to give you a sense of a few things um, that she's talking about, and I'm sorry, this is in my way, can't see. A uh, few things that she's talking about. Um, the a very early sex positive Tunisian sociologist, uh, theorist uh, in the Islamic tradition, um, who was talking, was and is talking about sexuality and sex as a prayer, a gift of oneself, and an act of charity, wherein discovering the meaning of sexuality is to rediscover the meaning of God and vice versa, and um, some really interesting connections to what has come before. Um, and then at the same time, some extraordinary startling statistics, uh, just amongst which I'm just going to throw in, a third of Egyptian women report that they have faced domestic violence, um, according to the World Health Organization. And of course, we know that those are those figures are underreported in a really extraordinary way. So those statistics are really quite remarkable, thinking about changes in that region. So um, just last but not least, um, thinking about why this matters so much, why we want to think about gender and sexuality in tandem, and why we want to consider uh, a non-binary approach. Um, biomedical approaches to sexuality usually view sexuality as deriving from, from physiology, from sexual organs. And the problem with that is that that idea does not travel well. It does not travel around the world in a particularly fruitful manner. It also doesn't work very well in our own context as well, as you already know. Um, so just to take an example from Mexico, because we haven't been to Mexico yet. Uh, Mexico historically, particularly in rural agricultural regions, men who have sexual contact with men do not necessarily view themselves as homosexual in orientation. Rather, they see their orientation as deriving from the role they play in their family uh, through gender roles. Um, so a family man, they might also see um, that role, the role they play in sexual practice as being determinative. So a passive role being stigmatized, whereas an active role is not similarly stigmatized and not viewed as homosexual in orientation. So men who have sex with men has become a particularly important category of analysis due to higher risk factors and changes and transmission of uh, different kinds of sexually transmitted diseases, particularly HIV. Um, 
So thinking about men who have sex with men who practice but do not identify with a sexual orientation other than heterosexual. You can visualize all of the advertising, all of the campaigns that have been carried out um, focusing on homosexual orientation um, and practices. These will not carry meaning. These will not have weight. These will not reach uh, people who are within the category of men who have sex with men. Uh, so sex positive campaigns have to take the meaningful distinctions between sexual cultures into account in crafting campaigns for safe sex and as a community practice. Um, so kind of just to come to conclusion, the goal here is rather than viewing sexuality uh, as something that's a given, that's fixed, that's determined from outside, rather we're seeing it as a cultural construction, something that uh, is defined and learned interactively in a, in a specific social context. Um, and if we do that, I think we can hope to address some of the social justice challenges we see in the 21st century. Of course, those social justice challenges are particularly severe as we see right now. Um, and I'm so sorry, I forgot to time myself, but I'm just gonna assume that that worked. Um, and I was gonna say, I forgot to say uh, just one more point, which is a question that I often receive and something that you might be wondering. Um, there's no verifiable data on genetic components of sexual orientation. That's, that's not a, a, something that we can think about in terms of social science. Rather, we would say that genes matter and society matters. Um, and we're trying to come up with a map or a guide to understand how those pieces fit together, which is the point of this particular slide here. And then I, it just remains for me to thank you very much for sharing this cup of tea with me. And I will hope to have some interesting questions. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I am Dr. Faust, um, here tonight to talk to you um, mostly about uh, a study that I am uh, in the midst of conducting with the South Bend LGBTQIA Center. Um, I will uh, be sharing a PowerPoint, so let me get that going. All right, so um, I, as Jamie said in the introduction, um, I just started working with um, the South Bend LGBTQIA Center um, to conduct a survey of the community <clears throat> of individuals um, who identify um, in some way um, as part of the LGBTQIA community um, and to identify issues of discrimination uh, that, that they face here locally. Um, the reason for wanting to look into this locally is that um, there are long standing histories of uh, members of the LGBTQIA community experiencing prejudice and discrimination at very high rates compared to um, uh, members of the straight population. Um, <clears throat> When we think about discrimination uh, and the way that discrimination is faced by uh, members of this community, uh, we do need to keep in mind that um, LGBTQIA statuses intersect uh, very often with other marginalized identities. Um, and this is going to impact the amount and type of discrimination that individuals face. You'll see a little bit of this as I go through um, some of the statistics I have for you. Um, but again, um, these numbers are uh, likely to be even higher when we look at individuals um, who identify as member of the LGBTQIA communities um, who are also uh, people of color, uh, people with disabilities, um, and other uh, marginalized identities. Um, so I wanted to um, really quick, um, the survey in the South Bend area is uh, just about to kick off. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to having data soon, um, but I don't have any data right now about South Bend. Um, instead, um, what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight is 
uh, national rates of discrimination faced by members of the uh, LGBTQIA community. Um, so one of the most prominent areas um, where individuals face discrimination um, for their um, sexual orientation or gender identity is in uh, um, education. In 2019, um, the National School Climate Survey conducted by um, GLSEN showed that 86% of students who identified as LGBTQ uh, experienced harassment or assault. Um, interestingly, um, a little over half of these uh, incidents went unreported, mostly because the victims um, didn't think that they would be believed uh, when they brought these claims forward. Um, so we can see here that, um, you know, even starting off in um, uh, lower levels of uh, schooling and education, um, uh, children face discrimination um, there as well uh, as in later education. Um, when we look at the um, even further stigmatized identity of uh, individuals who are transgender, um, the 2015 transgender survey showed that <clears throat> of respondents who were out or who were perceived to be transgender in high school, 54% of them had been verbally harassed, 24% physically attacked, and 13 were sexually assaulted. Um, so education is um, a clear area of discrimination. Family uh, is another unfortunate area of discrimination. Um, uh, LGBTQ studies uh, show around 16.8% uh, of people uh, who identified as LGBTQ stated that they moved away from their family as a response to discrimination. Um, this is certainly a different level of discrimination fit than faced by, um, again, transgender respondents, 10% um, of whom uh, said that they had been the victim of violence by a family member, 8% of whom had been kicked out of their home uh, for being transgender. So not the choice to move away, but rather um, being um, uh, thrown out of the house. Um, so family is a, a big area. Work is yet another area where discrimination is faced. 52.8% uh, of people who identified as LGBTQ reported that it negatively impacted their work environment. 30% of transgender respondents who were employed who reported being fired, denied promotion, or facing some other form of mistreatment in the workplace. These are just a few of the air, uh, the three that I talked about with specific examples are just a few of many areas that LGBTQIA individuals are apt to face discrimination. Um, housing is another common um, area, healthcare, mental health care, uh, treatment uh, by law enforcement, um, fight access to finance, um, and also uh, additional legal problems. Um, this is most likely uh, uh, in the case of transgender um, individuals and uh, non-binary um, individuals. Um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of pull out a little bit and talk about um, quickly on this slide uh, is law enforcement. Um, the way that I found my way into uh, this particular study was actually um, in having done research uh, previous research into um, discrimination faced by the LGBTQIA community by law enforcement. Um, and um, discrimination is most likely to be faced uh, by law enforcement or bleh, to be experienced in interactions with law enforcement um, when individuals don't fit uh, stereotypical gender roles. Um, and so uh, it's very problematic for um, uh, transgender individuals whose driver's licenses may not match um, the gender that they present. Um, and so this is definitely an area where uh, discrimination can be felt and in, felt in very severe ways. Um, I want to, uh, my talk is um, a little bit um, Two, I've got kind of two focuses here. Um, I want to go off on a little tangent here um, and um, throw out a question um, in this 
acronym uh, at the beginning here that I've been talking about. So LGBTQIA, um, many people uh, think that the A in this acronym stands for ally, people who are supportive uh, of LGBTQ individuals. Um, this actually um, is not the case. Um, A actually stands for asexual or aromantic. Um, in this case, what that means is the uh, lack of sexual or romantic attraction to others to varying extents. Um, much like um, social scientists uh, talk about gender um, with relation to being on a spectrum, um, we also see um, sexual orientation on that on a spectrum and we would see sexual attraction and romantic attraction on a spectrum as well and so it's not a simple yes you are attracted to people or no you aren't um, there may be various degrees of attraction and there may be things that impact or precede um, any sort of attraction that you might feel um, one of the really interesting things about this identity is that um, many people um, who come to identify as asexual um, are not, not aware that this is an option. Um, so I wanted to use this opportunity to um, kind of share some of my own um, story a little bit because we are talking about um, sexuality and um, sexual identity, sexual orientation tonight. Um, so I wanted to share that um, I personally um, came to identify as a lesbian around the age of 27. Um, and it took me a really long time to uh, figure out that I had um, this attraction because um, I very rarely experience ro uh, romantic um, or sexual attraction to other individuals. Um, and I wanted to kind of claim this identity tonight um, to give it a little bit more meaning because language is very powerful. Um, and I personally only found um, this distinction of being asexual uh, a couple of years ago. And when I first started talking about it, um, I was talking with one of my best friends who is uh, transgender. And I told him that, you know, I think that I think um, I'm asexual. And he was like, I mean, is that really a thing, though? Um, <laughs> and it was very interesting, because, you know, here I have this friend who is very used to experiencing um, people doubting them and, you know, people kind of questioning um, how they're feeling about things. And yet it was very easy for him to fall back into that same um, uh, approach to me um, because we're all so extremely socialized into um, the sexuality and, um, uh, you know, kind of pervasive um, imagery and um, values that uh, are wrapped up in everything that has to do with the complicated nature of sex. Um, when I was younger, uh, I definitely thought that there was um, something wrong with me, not because um, I knew that I was attracted to women, but because instead, I didn't experience that attraction to any gender um, without having some sort of relationship preceding that. So thinking about these various um, uh, identities is important and language can be very empowering. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion around asexuality and um, concern over whether it is an actual sexual orientation or whether it is a um, medical condition. There's actually a very infamous episode of the show House um, where um, House thinks that uh, a, per a patient that is presenting asexuality, um, that it has to be some sort of sign of uh, a larger medical condition. Um, there's also a lot of um, 
uh, desire by some to kind of negate uh, asexuality by saying that um, this is something that happens or by pointing out that it's something that can happen or can, ugh, sorry, I've taught two classes today, so my words are getting all mixed up by this time of day. Um, when we think about this, um, there's a high correlation of individual, or when we look at this, there's a high correlation of individuals um, who identify as asexual, who have experienced sexual trauma at some point in their life. Um, so in some ways, um, there's an impetus to kind of write this off as some sort of um, uh, adaptation to trauma. So <clears throat> my point in kind of bringing this up tonight um, is that sexuality is varied, um, not even just in, uh, you know, how much you want to have sex, but whether or not you do and with whom and when. Um, and so I wanted to um, kind of give a little bit of um, personalization to um, the alphabet uh, of discrimination here that I was talking about tonight. So my talk's a little bit different than other people, um, and it's a little shorter as well. So I'm going to wrap up and kind of leave some more time for uh, questions and uh, for our last presenter. All right. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Majedic, and I'm 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 going to be our last panelist for tonight. And I'm going to take us uh, yet in yet another direction, um, away from the human side of things, um, because I don't study humans. Um, I actually study plants. And um, so, what I want to talk a little bit today about is. Uh, sexuality from a plant perspective, which is kind of a, a strange way to think about things, but is actually a really relevant one. Um, so my area of expertise is actually plant reproduction, or as I like to tell my students, I study plant sex. That's what I do for a living. Um, so one of the things that's really fascinating about uh, plant reproduction is it's been studied for centuries now for a number of different reasons, but there are two kind of main focal points that, that people use when they're, we're focusing on plant mating systems and plant reproduction. Um, one is the connection to food and agriculture. Um, we wouldn't be able to eat most things if it weren't for plant sex. So we eat the reproductive parts of plants and um, this is a picture of the South Bend Farmer's Market. And I, I really love this picture because it shows every possible plant structure that, that you can find. Um, so these lovely zucchini down here at the front, those are actually fruits. Um, so when you eat a zucchini, you're actually eating a fruit. Um, they bear seeds. You would not get a zucchini without plant sex. In the same way, you see these lovely uh, green uh, peas here, pea pods. Those are fruits as well. The peas inside them are seeds. So those are baby plants. So are these uh, little squashes here. Those are also fruits. But then you have some leaves here. Um, looks like some very beautiful kale, um, as well as some stems. Potatoes are actually stems. They're underground storage stems. And the reality is, is you don't get any of these things unless you actually have plants that reproduce and grow and change over time. The reason I study uh, plant reproduction though is, is a little bit different from this. I'm actually drawn to plant uh, reproduction uh, because of some of the challenges that are presented by the act of reproduction for plants. And that's, I'm not alone in this. This is an area that's been studied um, and written about by scientists for, 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 like I said, centuries. Darwin wrote an entire book about this. Um, different than his most well-known work, but still pretty compelling. Um, the challenge of reproduction for a plant is, is how do you find a mate? Because unlike the animals we think of and we, we see out in the world, uh, you can't get up and move to, to go find a mate. You're stuck in one place, you're rooted to the ground. And these are just some examples of how 
these plants, sometimes they're right next to one another in, in a field and sometimes they're spread out. So this field of lupines here on the left um, and then this, this field of uh, phlox on the roadside in, in Texas, um, both plants that I've studied in the past, um, a plant up over in the front of the field in our, in our picture can't get up and walk to a potential mate in the back of the field. And so trying to figure out how you're going to reproduce when you're spatially spread out and kind of separated from potential mates. And we've studied this from an evolutionary perspective. Part of my training is in evolutionary theory. And so one of the things we focused on is floral structure and flowers as a way to advertise and get stuff, uh, get organisms to help you find a suitable mate. And we, we know that part of what we see as the diversity of floral forms out there in the world is shaped by this drive to get an appropriate mate um, to you. So I'm gonna focus my the rest of my remarks on this challenges of reproduction piece and, and talk a little bit about why people spend so much time thinking about it. Well, um, one of the things that we do in introductory biology is we, we tend to talk a little bit about reproductive structures. And one of the things that often we show students right out of the gate is a diagram that looks like this. And it's, this is a cutaway of a lily and it shows you some of the basic structures, the reproductive structures that we see in a flower. And one of the things that I wanna point out about this particular diagram is that what you see in front of you is actually hermaphroditic structure. So many of our basic starting points for flowers, when we start looking at flowers and thinking about flowers is from this hermaphroditic um, viewpoint. You have petals on, uh, and these green structures that are there for support called sepals along the outside edges. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, and then in the center, you have two kind of what we call whorls of structures um, that are male and female. So the whorl towards the, the very core is the female reproductive structure called the carpal. And uh, down at the base, you see the ovary and you have this fleshy pad called a stigma and that's where pollen actually lands. And pollen will actually drill a, a tube called a pollen tube, we're not creative, um, through the fleshy style down to the ovary to fertilize the egg. Um, the male structures are the stamens, which have a little pollen containing sac called the anther at the top and then a long kind of filament that suspends the anther up above. And so when people talk about pollen allergies, um, what you're actually allergic to in pollen allergies are um, what we call the male gametophytes. It's the, the sperm bearing structure. Pollen is the sperm bearing structure. So that's what you're allergic to when you're allergic to, to pollen. So when you have a hermaphroditic flower like this, it actually presents a pretty elegant solution to um, the challenge of finding a mate. And that is, hey, I have male reproductive cells. I have female reproductive cells. How about I just have a baby with myself? And I love this diagram because you can see how easily that, that could happen. We have this place where the pollen lands, the stigma, and the anthers hanging right above it. Shake that flower, pollen falls out, falls right on the stigma. Bingo, bango, you can make a baby that way. And we do see plants that do that. We call that phenomenon um, self-pollination. And if you are a hermaphroditic flower, which we see a lot of in the botanical world, you can mate with yourself. And it makes it easier. You don't have to worry about going out and finding a mate anywhere. But there are some challenges that come with self-reproduction. Um, in Societal structures, human societal structures, we talk a lot about things like inbreeding and under certain circumstances, uh, sibling matings, cousin matings, uh, things like that. People start talking about royal families and, 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 and the like. And oftentimes when you see those in human structures, you see some challenges spring up amongst the offsprings of those matings. Um, 
famous stories about genetic diseases that are inherited generation after generation because of close uh, marriages within families. Um, we actually have a term for that. We call it inbreeding depression. And it stems from the fact that sometimes individuals can carry fairly what we call recessive traits. They're hidden by other genes. But when you put two relatives together, they both carry that recessive gene and then you see it. You see that disease phenotype in the offspring. And so you can actually see profound effects on survival and future reproduction when you have profound inbreeding. So we call it inbreeding depression. You're depressing the reproductive and survival success of those, or, of those individuals. It does not get more inbred than having a baby with yourself. You're both mom and dad. And so for certain species of plants, selfing is not a good solution to the challenges of finding a mate. So another possible solution is to try to get help from the world around you to move your pollen from point A to point B. Um, and so we see lots of adaptations for that kind of thing. Um, these are some examples of plants that are wind pollinated. Um, a lot of grasses are wind pollinated. This, this is a birch tree right here. Um, we see some different characteristics in plants that are wind pollinated. They usually don't have big showy petal filled flowers. Um, they usually just have the male or female reproductive structures. These uh, on this birch tree, they actually are separated into different sexes. More on that in this in a minute. Um, so you have male berry, male flowers that bear that pollen, female flowers that just have those stigmas. They have great big stigmas that are almost like catcher's mitts so that they have a bigger surface area to catch more pollen. Uh, grasses have these huge, huge anthers that can hold a ton of pollen because when you put it out into the world and let the wind take it away, you're gonna lose some. Not every, every single one of those pollen grains is gonna land on an appropriate mate. And so you make a lot of pollen. That's why uh, pollen allergies to grass are so common because there's just so much pollen out there in the world. Um, so, so wind pollination is, is one example and we call that cross fertilization or cross pollination when you're putting your pollen out there into the world. Another possible way to get around it is animal pollination. So to actually contract someone to come and help you carry the pollen off. There are lots of different animals that engage in those kinds of behaviors. So this is just a kind of a random assortment of some of the ones that I often talk about in my classes. We've got our friend the honeybee over here on these uh, verbenas. We've got this big fluffy bumblebee on this uh, dandelion in the center. This guy on the upper right corner, that's actually a moth. It's called a hawk moth. They have these long crazy tongues and they're fairly large. The first time I ever saw one, I thought it was a tiny bird. That's how big they are. We do have tiny birds that engage in this work. So we have hummingbirds like this guy in the lower left corner. And then um, bats actually engage in quite a bit of pollination in uh, certain types of ecosystems. What happens in these types of structures is that you do have these, big, these showy or trait oriented flowers that are particularly appealing to different types of pollinators. They make certain smells, they have certain colors, they have certain shapes that serve as like an, a, a big sign that says, hey, animal, come visit me. Often there's a reward associated with it and they come get a reward and then they carry the pollen off elsewhere. And so they're helping those plants mediate their sexual interactions with each other. Um, and so that's, that's where I spend a lot of my time working. But one of the things that I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about, um, particularly in recent years, um, is that sometimes just being able to bring in a pollinator doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't help you out. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that we often see flowers that are on these big stems, we call inflorescences. And it's quite possible that a pollinator could come in and move from one flower to the next on the same plant and pollinate multiple flowers using pollen from the flowers that are closer to the edges or down further on the stem. We actually have a fancy term for that called guytonogamy, 
The other thing that we can see is accidental selfing where a pollinator comes in and actually bumps around the male reproductive structures and causes self-fertilization um, without intending to. And so simply having a showy flower with lots of different characteristics to bring in pollinators or a wind pollinated plant doesn't always solve this problem. And so that's where um, different types of what we call plant mating systems or sexual systems kind of come into play. Um, there are ways in which plants have been shaped over evolutionary time to show different orientations of their sex organs so as to minimize the risk of self-pollination. And so there are lots of examples of this and I don't wanna go into all of them, but I wanted to give you a few examples to kind of show you that when we talk about sex systems in plants, we see this whole gamut of arrangements, not just hermaphrodites, not you know across the board. So one that I'm working on right now, I'm, I'm actually studying this phenomenon in daffodils, is something we call uh, heterostyly, or in this case, tristyly. It's when you have different sexual structures at different heights in the plants. And so you create this separation between your male and female structures so that you're less likely in, in certain forms to self-fertilize. So this, this individual, these are all from the plant species Oxalis. Um, the one on the far right is going to have less likelihood of being self-pollinated um, because the female parts are way up at the top at the mouth of the flower and the male parts are way down at the bottom. So you're very likely to have pollen deposited on those stigmas from another plant. Another example of how you can separate out sex systems is something we call diece. Um, diece occurs when we have two uh, plants that can actually have a gender expression. They're either male or female. And this is an example from the plant, uh, a plant genus called Sagittaria. And there is a clear female uh, plant. It's this guy here on the left and a clear male plant. Um, the little fuzzy dudes are the anthers. And so you actually have separate sexes, dioece. We use a lot of Latin and Greek to describe these. But then we have things that run the gamut in between. Um, one of my favorites is uh, I had a friend in graduate school that worked on this species. This is actually a plant species named horse, uh, called horse nettle. It's in the same family as potatoes and tomatoes. And in horse nettle, you actually have something called andromonese, um, mono one, Andro refers to the male structures. So in this particular case, you have flowers on the same plant that are male. Uh, they don't have a female function and that's the guy here on the right. Big, these great big giant yellow things are the anthers. And then you have some plants that are hermaphrodites. Um, they have that long stigma sticking out from between the anthers. And that's all on the same plant. So it has flowers that are male uh, functioning and flowers that are hermaphroditic and have a female function as well as male. Um, I spent a lot of time working with a group of people who worked on wild strawberries. It turns out they have a system called gynodiaceae, um, separate plants that are either male sterile, so they're female, or um, they're hermaphroditic. And so they have two different plants, hence the dioeci part, one that has a more female oriented function and one that's hermaphroditic and serves as that male function for the whole population of plants. And you can see that the structures are a little bit different depending on whether they produce both male and, and female structures or just female structures. And then finally, something that I've spent um, some time working on most recently is the idea that you could be hermaphroditic but express your sexes at different stages in time. Um, we call that phenomenon dichogamy. And so in this particular example, this is a plant species I worked with in the Florida Keys. Um, we actually had synch uh, synchronous dichogamy. Um, these were, uh, this is a plant species called canella and it, it's a shrub. And what actually happens is the flowers start out their, their lives when they open up and this is true of the whole tree as female, and you can see the, the fleshy stigma. They spend about 12 to 24 hours as female, and then they start to lose that female function and they go into a neuter phase. And then the anthers, which are make this kind of column around the center of the flower, release their pollen. 
And so we end up seeing this transition from female to male over the lifespan of the flower in about 48 hours. So what you can see in these examples, and I'll just leave this one up uh, is for, you know, for some color, is that with, when it comes to plant reproduction systems, we get this whole range of different expressions and they're all similar or different ways to solve the same problem, which is how do I maximize my reproductive success while considering the fact that self-fertilization may not be a good option from a long-term species survival perspective. And so I will end there and turn things back over to our moderators. Great, thank you so very much to all our panelists. I think that this our community learned quite a lot of information. I think there's threads that we can take away rejecting binaries, um, some intersections of your comments there. We don't have a ton of time left, but we do have time for a few questions and some participants have already started asking questions. So why don't we go ahead and get started here. Um, we have a, a, one participant who said, and I really think that Dr. Koblenz, they're directing this question to you, although I think that many of you could come in here. What about sex just for pleasure? Is that fruitful? So when you were talking about Farley's work, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Um, it's a great question. And I think uh, the short answer is it depends, um, right? I think what these, um, these guidelines from Farley help us do is to apply the norm of, in this case, fruitfulness to the particularities of one's own sexual experience or sexual relationship. So um, I think what a person ought to ask oneself in this case is, is the, the pleasure that I am kind of reflecting on, is it fruitful? It does this actually, um, you know, enhance my relationships? <laughs> does it enhance how I experience myself? Um, broadly construed, does this make me a better person in the world? And I think we can think of examples where pleasure might not do that. <laughs> um, like one, one thing that comes to mind immediately is, you know, certain forms of, you hear about extreme forms of like pornography addiction where people, um, you know, become addicted to pornography uh, for the sake of self-pleasure, um, of masturbation, and uh, are, so, are addicted to the point that they cannot experience sexual pleasure with um, their, you know, committed sexual partners, so, uh, you know, anyone other than uh, with themselves and in, in the context of pornography. That strikes me as an example of where um, self-pleasure is not fruitful. It is not making you a more generative um, and, uh, you know, flourishing member of a, of a community. But, but I think, you know, we are embodied creatures. And there are lots of instances when experiences of pleasure, um, you know, can actually unify us with other people, um, can help us um, understand our own bodies in a way that builds um, confidence and understanding and um, connection with, with humankind in the world. Um, and so I certainly think that there are, there are situations where pleasure um, can be can be fruitful, um, but not all pleasure. So that's why we have to we have to think about the particularities of the situations that we're in. I should also mention that um, that you know Farley, the theologian that I was uh, kind of drawing from for these norms, um, wrote a whole book about using uh, justice as a as a positive norm for. Um, for sexual ethics in the Catholic tradition, and she has a section 
um, where she talks about the implications of this for particular issues like masturbation um, and other kinds of uh, sexual arrangements. And so um, if any of you out there are interested in how she applies this to particular situations, um, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll scan it and send it your way to give you more to think about. Thank you so much. And perhaps all of you could even, um, well, no, they cannot see your emails, so they can, well, they'll look you up. <laughs> Not hard to do on our website. Um, Dr. Koblenz, while you're, while you're talking here, there's another question that I think really is for you about Farley's work and the dynamic between prohibitions and positive obligations. So this participant said, I'm curious though about when they might be in tension or in direct conflict for example, when own fruitfulness can only be found in sexual actions and relationships that are prohibited in the Catholic faith. Will you speak to that a bit more? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so from a from a Catholic theological perspective, in an ideal situation, there shouldn't be these tensions. <laughs> and the reason why is because uh, Catholics profess belief in one God who created the world, who wills for uh, humankind to, uh, to have particular types of, of relationship, like, like I said, with God, self, and others. And so if there's one God and somebody is making claims that, you know, uh, this particular sexual act is prohibited, but this sexual act, the same sexual act is fruitful, which one is right? These are in conflict. If there is that kind of conflict, then somebody has to be wrong, right? It can't be that the, the universal God of all is saying two contradictory things, at least from a, a Christian perspective, that should not be the case. So that it's actually the, the job of theologians, the reasons why scholars like me exist is to argue those things out, <laughs> okay? Somebody's wrong, so that means either um, somebody misunderstands fruitfulness, or maybe the way that, um, that fruitfulness is being applied to a particular situation is misguided. Maybe the whole norm of fruitfulness needs to be rethought altogether. <laughs> um, these sort of, these sort of conflicts are exactly what theologians argue about so that ultimately, ideally, <laughs> Um, the, the church reaches some agreement on a particular issue. And there are lots and lots and lots of examples throughout church history, including um, with regard to teachings on sex, where there have been conflicts that led to very significant changes in church teachings because people brought these tensions to light and theologians argued about it and eventually official changes were made. So, so, um, so these tensions are real. That's what theologians are working on. In the meantime, though, people have to live their lives <laughs> and have to negotiate their, you know, day-to-day -day sexual decision making. And, and for that reason, I think it's important to, to note that the obligation of Catholics is always to follow your conscience, <laughs> to follow the, the moral compass that uh, Catholics believe God gifts to all human beings. <laughs> and in order to follow one's conscience, the Catholic Church teaches that you should, you know, seek greater understanding about the moral decisions that you're making. So if you find yourself in, in the kind of tension that this question raises, where, um, you know, you're, you're sort of conflicted about what a right sexual relationship ought to look like, um, the church teaches that you should get as much information and good counsel about the decision as you can, and then, um, and then make a decision according to your own conscience. <laughs> um, and 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 Christians believe that uh, the Holy Spirit, which is God's sort of invisible presence, is is helping people with that process of discernment. Um, and so, uh, yeah, well, like I said, while theologians are arguing it out on an official level, uh, every individual person uh, should be doing what they discern to be best according to their conscience. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the next question is for Dr. Faust specifically. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you came to identify more with asexuality and then the second part of the question is telling us a bit more about the difference between 
um, aromantic and asexual. Is that a spectrum as well? Yes, I can. <laughs> and I'll even do it with the sound on. Um, so <laughs> um, for me, it kind of was, um, oh goodness. Okay, so I'm going all out for the personal disclosure um, tonight. So uh, it was probably the second time in my life that I had um, very strong feelings for somebody that was in my life. And um, you know, when that didn't pan out the way I wanted it to, I did a lot of self-reflection, like, why does this keep happening with people that I know? <laughs> and then I started reading more, like, act, cause at first it was just a rhetorical question. Like, you know, these questions we pose to ourselves all the time, like, why am I so weird? Why am I not like anybody else in the whole world? Right. Um, because we, we do that first, right. With a, our first go-to is that it's, it's, us like that we're defective that you know there's something wrong and so you know I actually really was curious and I I did some reading and I came across um the term ace and I <laughs> did what a whole lot of other people my age um did yet they did it a lot earlier in their lives um I stumbled across stuff on tumblr um there really is there's research out there that says that like something like 80% of people who take this annual asexuality survey, which it's only taken by people who can find the survey and even know that it's out there. Um, like 80% of those people found out about this on Tumblr. Um, and so it's very much people writing about it and writing about their own experiences. Um, there are some distinctions within um, asexuality and aromanticism that um, I'd, I don't want to get into all of the variations, but there's like um, uh, gray sexuality or demi sexuality that is um, like, it's not that you never experience romantic attraction or sexual attraction. It's that that attraction is predicated on like a close personal bond rather than um, like seeing somebody and seeing somebody as a sexual object or a potential romantic interest when you see them on the street or when you meet them for the first time at a party or something like that. So for me, um, you know, it, it wasn't just like, wow, I've never had this whole love at first sight feeling. It was like, I've never had, um, you know, friends would talk about like, you know, oh goodness, I see somebody that looks like this. And, you know, I feel like my reproductive organs just start kicking into gear. And I honestly, like, I thought that people who said these sorts of things just had to be like lying because I'm just like, I don't understand what you're talking about. I have, I have no basis for that. Um, and, you know, even just kind of seeing someone in a social setting and being like, are they attractive? Yes, I can say objectively they meet the cultural standards but I don't find people attractive in that, like at that moment in that way. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit about my personal, you know, finding. Um, and it really is, a, it is about the power of language. Once I knew about it, um, I, you know, the things I started seeing, it was just like, whoa, 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 you know, constant, like that explains this, that explains this, that explains this. Um, and so just to talk a little bit about the, the um, two terms that I've mentioned here, um, aromantic and asexual. Um, roman aromanticism is basically that you don't experience romantic attraction and asexuality is that you don't experience sexual attraction. Now that's in thinking in totalitarian forms. Both of those things are on a spectrum, right? You can have a lot like a hyper overdrive addiction, right? Or a, um, a fixation on sexuality and your sex drive, um, or you can have none. Um, sometimes having none is a medical symptom, but there are also varying degrees um, of that as well. Um, and, um, uh, 
and then romanticism is kind of that like um just kind of like the 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 spark the chemistry that's not about like mm, yeah I want to go have sex or something yeah um and I um there's an excellent book that just came out. I feel like it was timed perfectly um, for me to be able to talk about this. Um, it's a book called ACE, um, A-C-E by Angela Chen. Um, her last name is C-H-E-N. Um, and I, you know, it's been another one of those, it's it's kind of like reliving my first um, reading about this on Tumblr because as I was reading the book, um, it was, you know, again, it was just more of that, like, yes, that's things I experienced. Yes, that's something I've experienced. Yes, that's something I've experienced. And um, one of the really great analogies that she um, points out is um, there's some criticism for um, people, aces, um, because the idea is that, um, you know, we're just being too nitpicky with identities, right? You know, like, so you don't want to have sex all the time. Why do you have to broadcast that to everybody? Um, just don't do it then, right? Um, and so she says, you know, it's kind of similar to saying, well, you know, you want to you want to wear monkey sock hats all the time. That, that's fine. We can make a distinction. We can make a category for that. Maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we're being too nitpicky about that. But our culture isn't organized around wearing sock monkey hats. Our culture is organized around sex and sexuality. Even if we, even if some of that organization is to avoid talking about it or to avoid interacting about it in certain ways, we're, we're constantly, um, you know, kind of ordering life based on things that are, that have to do with sex in some way, shape or form. And so to be, you know, kind of removed from that is a unique perspective, if you will. So the book is fantastic and I highly recommend it. Even if you, you know, even if you have romantic and sexual attraction for anyone and everyone, I think it's very enlightening book. So I'll stop talking. Thank you so much. I think maybe we have one more question. We could, we really do have to tie things up at eight o'clock. Um, but there's a really thoughtful question here. Do we perpetuate this binary as at a woman's college? And how do we seek to uproot the system when we actively benefit from it? So maybe one or two of you could just throw out a couple comments or responses to that. It's an easy question, right? Um, so I was looking at that question and, and um, mulling it over this whole time. Um, what an interesting question. I, I think it would be worth having a broader conversation about um, maybe not being a women's college anymore, but um, getting out of that binary and, and giving ourselves a, a different form of distinction. So one of the things that I think St. Mary's um, does pretty effectively for many people who come is, is create a community in which it's, it's possible to actually become the thing that you, you were hoping you could become or, or get the job or, or move out into the world with a great deal of confidence. Um, certainly not for everyone, but for a lot of people. Um, is that necessarily tied to womanness? Is that necessarily tied to gender? Maybe we, we, could, we could move beyond that and actually think, um, I think one of the things that ties all these talks together is, is the focus on language and what language does and how it's productive. And I think we could be more productive in our language. I, I, I think, um, you know, probably the 21st century is the time to do that. And I think uh, it would, you know, from my point of view, I think it would be really, really beneficial for the institution as a whole. So students, faculty, staff, people more broadly, um, I think it would do something for the community of South Bend as well. So um, if, and I'm sorry, I, I can't remember who posed that question, but if that's something you wanna have a conversation about, I think that's something that absolutely could be made to happen. Uh, and you would have other people who'd be interested in talking about it as well. So that might not be the most satisfying response, but let's keep talking about sex. <laughs> And I'll, I'll add that's something that women's colleges around the country are grappling with. And um, they're not all having a one size fits all 
uh, response to, to that question. And it does require a lot of reflection, I think. And that's something that we haven't done a lot of at St. Mary's and that uh, it may be time to do in, in, in more uh, concrete ways. Great. Well, thank you so much. We really just appreciate all of you and your time and your expertise. And for all the participants, thank you for attending. Please do keep this conversation going. Look us up. Um, let us know if this is something you'd like to have annually because it could become like an annual series that we do here at St. Mary's. So thank you again. We appreciate you. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.